Well, um, thank you, Sally, for um, inviting me and for your suggestions or readings, materials to help me with the talk. Um, thank you to Lauren Prescott, who, as Sally mentioned, is the INS archivist um, and, and whose professional work, but personal connection to the material um, has really helped me. And she was a great um, sort of sounding board for some of the ideas um, that, that come up in this talk. Thank you to, to Gary and Doris Christellis for inviting me to their home, um, which uh, as you'll learn was originally part of the, the boys school, was uh, one of the dorms. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, at the end, we'll do a question and answer, but I've already heard some great stories from people here about the boys' school. So sure, ask me questions, but also share any memories or, or comments um, that you have, because my take on, on the school um, is very much driven by, by the work I'm doing, by the research I've done um, on the 1920s and 30s. So it's that particular take, but there's so much to talk about, about the boys' school um, and about the inn more broadly. So... March 7th, 1934. March 7th, 1934, raw and misty. Today, the farm help were up on the mountain burning brush this afternoon. The electrical crew are working in the school repairing the motor on the dishwashing machine and fixing up the lighting system, which was put out of order when the carpenters were building the locker rooms, cloak rooms, and repairing the kitchen. In the evening, some of the boys practiced on their musical instruments, and all over the house, you would hear the squeak of the violins, toot toot of the cornets, rum tom tom of the drums, ping ping of the banjos, and plank plink of the piano. This entry from the Daily Diary written by students gives a sense of the range of activities on any given day at the wayside in boys school. Students at the school gained experience in agriculture, carpentry, electrics and other trades and created music, plays, pageants and dance performances. The photo here from 1934 indicates this range of activities as each boy is dressed for something different from the overalls of industrial or agricultural work to the suit and tie of the student keeping up on current affairs in the front there. Collectively, they capture the opportunities available to the boys school students, opportunities made possible by this experiment in education and innovation, a learning by doing approach to trades and traditional academic subjects, and an education in citizenship rooted in the rural rather than the urban, the site commonly looked to for innovation, ingenuity, and modernity. A 1947 entry in the school diary explains that, quote, we have a new work and school schedule which went into effect today. We all attend school in the morning and work in the afternoon. A note later added by the Wayside Inn worker who at the time was looking after these records wonders, quote, why school officials did not put this schedule into effect much earlier in the school's life. My answer is because this was not the intent, the original mission of the school. But by 1947, as this entry indicates, the original mission was over. And a few months later, the school closed for good as funding from the Ford company was finally cut off. So what was the original mission? What was the intent of the Wayside in School for Boys? And how was it an experiment? How was it innovative? My talk tonight takes on these questions and offers an analysis of the school, its intervention in early 20th century ideas of citizenship and settlement, and its intersection with more recent discussions of project-based learning in both STEM and humanities subjects. In particular, I want to point out that the school is a crucial study in rural modernism 
In other words, the school and Henry Ford's wider plans for the Wayside Project help us to see how some saw rural places as engines for change and as alternatives to the increasingly crowded cities associated with the growth and prosperity of the roaring 1920s. In this case, we see how then rural Sudbury was imagined as an innovation center that could help restructure the social and economic infrastructure of America. Henry Ford is known the world over as an automobile genius of history, recorded a 1927 article in the Atlantic Magazine. There is, quote, there is no passable road in the world that is not traversed by his cars. His planes are in the air. He has developed a vertical organization extending from the raw ore in the depths of the earth over a railroad transportation system and ending in millions of throbbing automobiles. Yet all this great network of industry is a single unified mechanism. It is not so often realized that he has been making a significant development in the field of education. The Wayside Inn Boys School was not just a part of this significant development, this significant experiment, but also a key component of Ford's vision of the village model as unified mechanism. While Ford is of course best known for making cars, he was also interested in re-engineering American life in many other ways. His motor company had a sociology department that helped in hiring and training workers. He established a trade school for boys in 1916 in Michigan near his auto plant. And as we learned last month um, from Professor Jesse Swigger, he assembled Greenfield Village an outdoor museum uh, of American history in Michigan, similar to Colonial Williamsburg and Sturbridge Village. Unlike Greenfield Village, Ford, I think, did not intend the wayside area to be a living museum, but rather a living model of what could be possible for America. Instead of, instead of worrying about how to handle crowded cities, swelling with workers from rural areas and with recently arrived immigrants, Ford thought that small villages, self-contained and self-sustaining were a possible future. And Sudbury was his testing site. His wireframe model, which could be twisted and twisted and shaped uh, to accommodate local needs like geography, but which could also be scaled out to serve as a model for rural enterprises across the country. So I have an image up here from the Henry Ford, which is, is sort of the, the uh, association that, that keeps a lot of the records on Ford's work in Greenfield Village. It's, it's difficult to see um, in its own, uh, in its own case, not just from this slide. There is a copy of it, a version of it, hanging in the display uh, across the hall here. But essentially, it's from 1926, mm -hmm. and it looks at, it's this vision of what Sudbury could be. Um, I put in some close-ups here. And again, if you can see it, but I'll talk through it. So one of the close-ups is, is the title, Proposed Development of a Colonial Village of South Sudbury, Massachusetts. And it's drawn up by some landscape architects in uh, Groton. Massachusetts. At the bottom, I, I extracted the, the bottom of, of, the, um, of the panel. And again, you can see it outside across the hall. And, and the reason I showed this is because it mentions this colonial village. And, and last uh, month, if you were here for Professor Jesse Swigger's talk or on Zoom, she was talking about this interest in colonial uh, preservation in the 1920s. Colonial Williamsburg, Sturbridge Village, Plymouth Plantation, there are a lot of, of these living museums founded at this time. My thing is let's change the word colonial to rural and then we see things a little differently. And my argument is that Ford was looking at, right, using a village model as, as a basis for re-engineering American society. Rather than based on cities, let's base it on villages. And the image at the bottom here um, to, to push my argument, it shows colonial houses, right? There's a colonial aesthetic 
but it, and it shows, you know, a horse and carriage, but it also shows what at the time would be a modern tractor. It shows a car, I'm sure a Ford car. It shows a bus <laughs> and it shows the new state highway. Um, Ford had Route 20, this strip of Route 20 out beyond the wayside and built in 1928 to avoid the inn. Um, to protect the inn. So very much, yes, he wanted a colonial aesthetic. He wanted a colonial looking village. But to me, it's it's a modern, it's a modern village. Okay. It's a modern village that's using this colonial aesthetic. So the historic architectures and activities like crafts and dance that Ford uh, wanted to preserve show off the aesthetics of his vision, a vision that took the village as social and economic model, a way of organizing people and places, and a means of educating students and visitors in, quote, the right way of living. The right way of living is a quote I take from Eva White, a Boston social worker who spoke of what was a constant concern in the 1920s, how to educate children and young adults in an era of population growth, technological change, and a shift from a mostly rural to a mostly urban country. While most like white looked at how to restructure cities and their citizens, thinking that they were the inev inevitable future, Ford focused on the rural to show that small scale teaching, learning, working and living was the ideal. I mentioned briefly these concerns of early 20th century America to put the boys school and Ford's wayside project in the wider context of what was going on at the time and to distinguish what made uh, the work here experimental. Before I return to the activities of the school boys, I wanna mention what else uh, Ford's wayside village model included to see how they looked both backward and forward traditions that could be reworked in the automobile age. For, I would argue, Ford was also always thinking about his main industry, automobiles. The Wayside Project was not just a model of village excellence, but an instantiation of the emerging motor economy, a site structured around its accessibility and desirability for tourists, for visitors by car and bus tours, the boys of the school learned the fundamentals of this new economy, of the automobiles that undergird it, and the full life of the modern village, all through a learning by doing approach. Along with the inn and restaurant, along with the inn and its restaurant and bar, the Wayside Project included a craft shop in what is now the carriage house, the Wayside Country Store further up the road in Route 20, a proposed textile mill and mini Ford motor plant and some other small industries that were never built, and to supply water to those enterprises, a dam and reservoir halfway up Knobscot Mountain that failed because of the porous soil and became no, known locally as Ford's Folly. <laughs> so just to go through some of these images, on the left here, we have the country store. Again, it's up the road, uh, just over the border in Marlboro. And that originally was a store in the center of Sudbury that Ford bought and moved that, to that location. On the right, there are a lot of images. So, so in the archive, and one of the things I wanted to do with this talk is give you a flavor of what's, what's in the archive, what I'm looking at. So you see a lot of photographs, a lot of photographs of cars, <laughs> a lot of photographs, a lot of discussions of cars. The boys will talk about one teacher got the latest, Ford Roadster. Um, I have no idea if there was some deal going on, right, if they got a deal from the Ford Motor Plant, but there are a lot of cars, a lot of Ford cars. There's the gatehouse, the, ca the carriage house across the way. That was a handicraft shop. And then on the right, we have two of the hostesses. So the hostesses worked at the front desk at the end, right, when you walk in. The boys kept a daily diary. I mentioned that every day from 1928 to 1947, the boys wrote in this diary. The hostesses also kept a diary all online. You can read them all. And they're wonderful. They give a sense of, of, of the kind of village atmosphere this was. Now, in the summer of 1931, 
there was a craze, a rage for these India print dresses. And so you read and they talk about, we're selling these India print dresses. I wonder if they'll sell. And then they talk about, you know, Mrs. Jones came up from Concord, Connecticut for the weekend, was fascinated with the India print dresses. We had to order more. And then we get a picture of them. So interwar influencers, interwar influencers right there. Can I just also point out, notice in these photographs, and we don't know exactly who's taking the photos, um, notice in each of these photographs, there's a car. So even in the country store, there's a car. In the carriage house, there's a car. So again, my argument is, yes, this is a colonial aesthetic, but not a museum. He wanted people to come and visit. He wanted this to be, to be living, to be growing, to be uh, an industry and a multifaceted industry, not just, not just based on tourism. Uh, Ooh, this, I just had to have a shot of, so this is Ford's Folly. Um, and I don't know if you're local, if you've ever heard of it, but essentially Ford um, built a dam uh, across the way here. You can go and see it. Okay, it's all overgrown, but it's this huge stone dam. And it was meant to be a reservoir that supplied drinking water and water for, for fighting fires for you know coming down the hill for this wayside village down here. The soil is sandy, so they would fill it up and then gradually go <laughs> into the ground. That's why it's called Ford's Folly. So I had seen it again in its wild state now, and it was just fascinating to see you know, what it looked like. And again, what the, what the promise was um, of this particular supply. So Ford's significant experiments, you know, all of this also included, of course, the boys' school. The school started operation in 1928 with 31 students. These students were all wards of the state, boys whose families could not afford to take care of them or boys already in foster homes. They were accepted to the school based on their application and examination, uh, as well as a physical and an interview. And Ford in the original days brought in social workers from, from Michigan to do the interviewing. Now this map, it, it's, I'm going to talk through it. Um, it's published in, this map is from uh, Kurt Garfield and Allison Ridley's book, Henry Ford's Boys, available for sale in the shop. Um, and I just want to give you a sense, where was the school? That's the question I always get, right? One simple answer, it was everywhere, right? All around here, all of this Wayside project was the school in a sense. That's where they were learning. But just to, to give you a sense of where the main sites were, um, you have where the Wayside Inn is, where we are now. You go past the Martha Mary Chapel, right this way. You go past the grist mill, and then there's a clearing there across from where the pond was. There's a, a clearing now. That's where the main site, it was called the Calvin Howe House. I have a picture. So that's where the boys um, lived, did some of the classes. Then as it expanded, uh, some of the boys stayed in up Dutton Road. Uh, what's called what was called Dutton Lodge, and it was the Solomon Dutton House, and then they built two additions, and it was this huge complex. And then after when Ford, when the Ford Company left, that complex was divided up into three separate houses. So if you drive up Dutton Road, there's the one on the left, big white house. Gary and Doris is stop by. They said anytime. <laughs> house on the white. Across the street is a red house. That red house was originally attached to Doris and Gary's. And then if you go further on, there's another white house on the left. That was the third part. Okay. Now some other sites. So we have the grist mill here. We have, oh look, we have Tony Howe's house. Uh, the Ezekiel Howe house over here, which is where there was a dairy farm. So, so there was agriculture and industry. Dairy farm here. The Wayside store is over here in Marlboro. Um, also along Dutton Road, there was something called the laboratory, the lab, which to me is very similar to today's like maker spaces that a lot of schools have. They go in, they play around with some tools, they fabricate things, they make things, um, they play around a bit. There's the uh, down further Route 20 is the Adam Howe House, uh, poultry, livestock. So, so this gives you a sense. I could put this up. You can take a look um, during the Q&A. It's in Kurt Garfield's book. But it gives you a sense of where everything was. Now, let's take a look at some pictures. Isn't this amazing? So this was the Calvin Howe House. This is where the boys' school, if you were to say where was the boys' school, like one of the primary buildings. This was it. This was in that clearing 
up along past the Martha and Mary uh, Chapel, dorm with some classroom space. This then gives you a sense of uh, the inside. So on the right is the Calvin Howe house. On the left is the inside, is the inside of a dorm. Below that is what's called the classroom. And it was behind, um, the, to, behind Dutton Lodge, I'll point it out. And then there's the inside of the classroom. This was the laboratory. Um, this was up Dutton Road, turned right like Carding Mill Pond on the pond. So, so it's a long dirt road off Dutton Road over here. And uh, this, I like this shot. Um, so this is what I was mentioning. This is Dutton Lodge. This is the house that was actually three houses. Right? This is now three houses separated. That's the main dorm. Right here is where that red house is on Dutton Road, which was the greenhouse. Um, here is the classroom that I showed. And on the map, there was another thing um, behind the greenhouse, it was called the ski jump. Is it that hill? I don't know if it's that hill. There's a ski jump um, <laughs> over there. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, OK. So the development of the school in its early days was followed eagerly by the Boston Globe and the New York Times. Quote, Henry Ford invents a school, announced one article in April 1930. Quote, in Sudbury's old New England atmosphere, he applies to the training of boys the methods he would use in attempt to solve an engineering problem. Quote, it's as if he had, <laughs> it's as if he had listed the traits and skill necessary to successful living in the 20th century as he sees them and were devising a school in which boys may acquire them by the most direct method. The direct method was learning by doing, and the description of the school sounds similar to approaches to education today. Instead of 20th century, we now talk about 21st century skills, as well as design thinking, STEM, and direct links to industry. But these were not ideas that Henry Ford invented in the 1920s. So that Henry Ford invents a school. Learning by doing was the general principle of the education strategies John Dewey and others espoused at the time. And the principle itself, learning by trying, picking something out and figuring it out, was not exactly a complex theory, but rather one rooted in common sense, a ground up pedagogy that tried to make formal school learning more like an organic practice. Likewise, Ford did not invent vocational education. The Smith-Hughes Act of 1917 offered federal money for districts to develop vocational schools, but even earlier schools and other institutions had offered some sort of job training for young adults. Nor did Ford invent the farm-based school. The Hillside School, for just one local example, was founded in 1901 in Greenwich, Massachusetts, and later moved to another farm in Marlborough. So what exactly was Ford's experiment in education? More specifically, what was experimental about the Wayside Inn Boys School? Two things, I think. First, it took a learning by doing approach to everything. And second, it showed how the rural village could be a model for modern America. So first, the learning by doing. This was not just some aspect of one particular class or another component added to an already packed curriculum. Learning by doing was the curriculum of the entire school and indeed of the entire Wayside project. When I mentioned that the note from 1947 that asked why the school hadn't always done the classes in the day, work in the afternoon schedule. It was to call attention to the original design of the school in which everything was both work and class, doing and learning. So here on the left is the a daily schedule from 1929. They get up at 6.30. Uh, breakfast, opening exercises, um, there, there usually was a Bible reading, someone would speak. Then it just says classes, dinner, classes, supervised games, supervised games, uh, supper, uh, recreation, study. Okay, so these classes blocks, what we see is classes, if we look on the right, 
um, you see what, what are termed classes were a range of activities that the students rotated through. At one point it was eight through 12, the school. So, so those are the columns across eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then it says what they're doing each week, what they're rotating through. So they would spend a week doing what are called domestic duties. That means you had to do the, the cooking and cleaning, a week doing industrial work, a week doing academic subjects. So all of these classes were a mix of activities, not just what we would think of as, as the academic subjects and not just what the 1947 diary entry mentions, classes in the day, work in the afternoon, right? They were all classes, all these um, activities. So uh, from the, so just one of the things I found interesting and, and you can barely see it maybe, notes, what is in the archive or notes about uh, figuring out what they wanted to do with each of the classes. And a lot of them mentioned this practical application. So in the bottom right, this course aims to give the pupil a practical knowledge of the use of, of machine tools. So from the 1930s on, classes included algebra, geometry, shop mathematics, physics and chemistry, literature, composition, history, electrical, mechanical, and automobile engineering, plumbing, and carpentry. Students in their final year chose to specialize in a topic which included hospitality, cooking, automobile work, engineering, agriculture, or retail, as students got experience working in the Wayside Country Store, where they learned about display and marketing strategies. So I, I saw this photo, and if you can see, it's a group of students um, um, dressed as, as chefs, as cooks, you know, possibly working in the kitchen. And I thought, what a great image to show this sort of learning by doing approach. Um, and then I thought, maybe they're just doing a play. <laughs> Like maybe that was just a play and I'm re you know, reading it, like maybe it's just Sweeney Todd. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, students, again, the learning by doing. So students installed and repaired water lines and electrical systems and ran the working farm. They built a cooling plant located next to the grist mill. They maintained the overall grounds of the Wayside campus. And as I mentioned, they worked in the country store. They also helped to build the Martha Mary Chapel, um, which was constructed in part from wood from trees knocked down in the 1938 hurricane. Students were paid for this work. It, the, the scholarship system was, was interesting in that students were paid for the work, but then they had to pay the school back for, for being here. They did save some money, um, but it was a, a work as you go and it depended on you know, the quality of the work, um, the amount of work you did. So they received a scholarship to live and study at the school um, and they were paid, but they had to pay the school back for what they were doing. It fit into Ford's belief that paying students, paying workers a decent salary meant that they would have more money to spend on items like cars and thus bolster the entire <laughs> economy. Um, by paying the students, the school could also teach budgeting and the benefits of learning to save. Um, through learning by working here, students would become more responsible, thrifty citizens when they left, successful producers and consumers. Students also worked in the school laboratory that uh, using machines for cutting wood and metal and working on automobiles. Learning by doing, of course, is not an unfamiliar concept in trades. The best way to learn to use certain machines is to use the machines. But strikingly, the school also used this learning by doing approach in its humanities classes. Discussions today about how to save the humanities often invoke the project method of STEM subjects. And here in the 1920s and 30s, we see some examples. First, from the opening in 1928 until almost the last day in 1947, students contributed to a daily diary by writing an entry similar to the one you, you heard when I started. This was the, at the direction of Ford and entries were sent to Michigan to give an account of what was going on here uh, each day. While not an explicit English or writing lesson, this was what we would call writing for a public audience and an example of metacognition, thinking back on an activity through writing. 
The, entrance, the, the entries vary in level of detail and in handwriting, um, but they're the most substantial record that we have of what happened at the school. Like machine learning, writing in the diary was another hands-on approach, in this case, to capture facts and feelings. Now consider these entries from 1929. And again, I'm giving you a glimpse of you know, what you would see in the archive. So the first one at the top, today everybody was working hard to finish their work so they could go home. This is Thanksgiving, okay? So this is the day before Thanksgiving. Finish their work so that they could go home. The boys took all the rugs out of the house and cleaned them. The dormitories were swept, the paint washed, the reception room waxed. And by that time, it was all done and the house was very clean. The boys who were going home will go tonight and 18 boys will stay at home. It's quite poetic to me, this use of the term home three times. And home means both going back either to their foster home or relatives that they had in the area, that's home, but also that ending, 18 boys are staying home. So home is also here. We then get Thanksgiving uh, day, so, this is Thursday, November 28th, 1929. Today, the squad leader in charge, Hyman Seligman, went down to the inn and got the Thanksgiving food. He got turkey, candy, pudding, celery, and bread and butter. We had a very fine dinner. Mr. Campbell cut the turkey. And while he was cutting the turkey, Mr. Ford went by and waved his ax at us. <laughs> The new boys were thrilled, though, to think that they saw Mr. Ford, Mr. Ford that the, the dinner was relished. Ford liked to, to walk around the grounds and do a lot of wood chopping. He chopped wood. I, it, I realized that after um, I, I just had this vision, of, you know, you know something, something like that. Uh, in addition to, to writing, students also learn to express their attitudes to certain topics through public speaking. Starting in 1930 on Tuesday and Thursday mornings, a student would present a talk on any subject he wanted. These talks brought the English composition curriculum to life by putting each boy in charge of his own research, composition and elocution. Topics included radio circuits, the brain, aviation, and one student did his on neatness. <laughs> I just picture some like passive aggressive, like we need to be more concerned, you know. <laughs> some of us are not being neat and, you know, just, just doing a, a talk, but bless them, I would have probably done the same thing. Um, learning by doing also uh, applied to nutrition. Students received uh, lectures on health and hygiene, and one lecture in 1929 reminded students that you can't get parts for your body like you can for a car. <laughs> Quote, these little pieces of machinery in our body must last us a lifetime. And then came bioengineering, and you know, had that been <laughs> at the time, uh, they, they pretty would have changed the, the lecture. A focus on health extended to the student's daily diet, which was recommended by Ford. Listen to this. This is what they ate. Fruit and milk for breakfast. That's it. Fruit and milk. Starch and some meat at lunch. And then only meat and vegetables at dinner. The boys comment on this diet in the diary entry. Some note it does keep up their energy levels. The diaries were going back to Michigan. Ford and his people were reading this. So we never know what exactly is, you know, the authentic or what they wanted. So, so many do comment on the, the, the use value of this diet. Many others comment on, and this seems coded to me, a lot comment on, we had another great pancake breakfast. They got pancakes on the weekend. And I think it was just the carbs and the syrup. Um, but the way they're expressing this joy is, is this joy of have, uh, saying how great it was to have this pancake breakfast. Um, the photos here um, are taken, and, and again, if you can see these. So what we have is um, each boy had a card, and I, I don't know if it lasts you throughout the whole time of school, if not just the very beginning, but each boy is, is photographed. Um, I'm imagining this was part of the, of the physical. Um, and just to pause over these photos, it's indicating the healthy, right, young men that the school wanted to, to create 
um, really. So this is the result of these, of these lectures on health and hygiene and on the diet. So it's showing that off in a way. But, but just to pause over these for a second, um, what struck me is that they're similar to photos that were appearing in Europe throughout the time. We're talking about now the early 30s. And in, in, in Europe, there was a pastime, uh, a rage um, for healthy outdoor exercise. But it was also a way for nations to broadcast the vitality of their population in an era inching towards another world war. The young men we see in these photos would almost certainly soon become soldiers. So the photos document both the promise of youth and the sacrifice that many would ultimately make. Unlike the photos seen in other countries, the Wayside Boys, it seems, did not appear in organized calisthenics or fitness routines. Rather, the boys took their exercise from the work they did on site and the sports they could participate in. So they had a baseball team and a football team that would play um, local towns. Uh, boxing was a popular activity. This was exercise by doing, learning about fitness through eating and acting healthily rather than through a separate physical education class. Another form of fitness that also functioned as a history lesson was the dance classes. So every Friday evening here in this room, in the ballroom, um, and the musicians, right, the fillers would, would stand up here, they would have instruction on historical dances, uh, waltzes, polkas, the minuet, quadrilles, reels. They danced with girls who were brought over from Marlboro for the occasion. And Ford himself and his wife, Clara, joined them um, some evenings when he was in, in the area uh, to, to demonstrate. And there aren't great photos of the dancing. There are clips online. Um, the uh, the Wayside has put up a lot of the films from this period. And some you could see the dancing that went on here. And a lot of boys talked about that. They had a great time doing the dances. In the diaries, again, these are going back to Michigan. I think it was the opportunity to interact and, and to socialize, right? That was also um, a reason they were successful. Learning by doing extended beyond the Wayside campus as students frequently attended talks in public halls in Marlboro and Framingham. They went to the symphony and theater in Boston and they went out and if you see here, um, again, I don't know if you can see it, but it says less call for what, dentist, haircuts and dates, dates all in um, capital letters. And this is I think early forties, mid forties from the, from the dress. So they did get out, they did, go, they go, went to the movies, which again was a very 1930s, forties thing. They went to the movies all the time. Uh, there was a sort of black market and candy and chocolate and students would get frisked on their way back to make sure they weren't bringing this, these sweets in and then um, the stories that Kurt Garfield and Allison Ridley collected reminiscences from some from some of the alumni talk about you know how they would try to, to hide the candy but they did go out you know doing normal typical teenager things but also there was a cultural program going on right going to the Sym symphony hall in Boston right seeing seeing plays and performances, taking advantage of the area. Ah, yes. So one of the trips they took, um, they went to the Ford plant in Somerville, Massachusetts. And one of the boys records seeing the assembly line in process. And if, if you don't know Ford, invented uh, the, the assembly line of manufacture. You pass it on. So it's created collectively, um, but also more quickly. And one of the boys commented, and this is recorded in the Hostess Diary, 1932, uh, that one of the boys described the process uh, to assemble the cars. Each man does his own job so that he becomes an expert in it. This is the most timely way to produce so many. This is a direct observation of the assembly line method, um, which was an efficient method. Um, and, and efficiency is one of the primary markers of what Antonio, uh, Antonio Gramsci would call Fordism, would name Fordism in 1934. And interestingly, the diaries I picked up on 
used the word efficient and efficiency quite a few times. So in October 1931, a student wrote about the boys who are specializing in business. Quote, we must train our minds to work 100% efficiently in order to take a position in the modern business world. A November 1932 entry documents the arrival of an efficiency expert from Detroit. And in April 1935, it was reported that wayside students are held to a much higher standard of efficiency. For Ford, uh, he was interested in making the modern factory more efficient. And again, I would argue he was interested in making modern America more efficient overall. And to do so, he looked to the village. The village was Ford's ideal of an efficient landscape, everything in its place serving its purpose as people pass through each location. And here at the Wayside Inn, Ford tinkered with his model village. Unlike Greenfield Village, South Sudbury was not intended to be a preservation of the past, but a model for the future, a visionary village that could rival America's increasingly crowded cities as sources of innovation and ordered community. So in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, cities were a cause of concern and subject of several studies. Jacob Rees published his photographs of New York in the 1880s and 90s. In 1895, Gustave Le Bon published The Crowd, the first study at herd mentality. Soon after, Georg Simmel published uh, The Metropolis and Mental Life, a study of the pressures of urban life on the individual. And in 1915, the Chicago School started its studies of urban sociology in an attempt to understand the citizens that modern American cities were producing. To address some of the problems of these citizens, and in particular, to, to make model citizens from the many children of recently arrived immigrants, settlement houses spread throughout the cities from the 1890s on. In short, settlement houses were community centers where children and young adults could go to improve their reading, learn crafts, participate in plays and other activities, and become productive Americans. Whereas settlements were embedded in urban centers, Ford experimented with a method that made productive modern Americans in a rural setting. Uh, he produced what I would argue is a form of rural settlement. The Wayside Inn Boys School functioned very much like a rural settlement house as it offered many of the same activities as its city counterparts, including on instruction on health, economics, civics, and personal responsibility. The last names of the students suggest Polish, German, Greek, Jewish, and Italian backgrounds. And it is likely that these boys were the grandchildren or children of immigrants who arrived in the waves into America in the late 19th and early 20th century. Had they lived in Boston, they would have been the target audience for the urban settlement. Through the Wayside Inn Boys School, however, they were able to learn a different approach to succeeding in the modern world, a small scale approach that showed the importance of making space for different types of work in a single setting. They were also taught to value each person and place's contribution through an innovative interdisciplinary curriculum that intermingled work play, worship, industry, agriculture, and the preservation of rural America. This was a productive modern workplace that maintained the traditions and aesthetics of America's past re-engineered for a successful future. Now, just to conclude, uh, a little side note for my own personal interest. I was going through the archive, and one of the first things I saw was a map of the school this is from 1932. And next to the boys' school, it says aviation field. <laughs> so my, I was, did, did, was this a landing strip, right? Was this a, a landing strip? Was Ford flying in? Curious. Then as I got into the diaries, I started noticing right, more references. So on July 13th, 1929, someone mentions that one of the boys is, quote, working on an airplane. OK. 
December 12th, 1929, motorcycle parts for an airplane. One of the teachers had come back from Worcester and was bringing motorcycle parts for an airplane. Fascinating. In December 26, 1929, I get a photo of the airplane. And if you look in the front there, it's this tiny model airplane. So I'm like, well, okay, case closed. So I thought. February 16th, 1930. Reference to a boy, quote, assembling an airplane motor. So that model plane would not take an airplane motor. So there's more to the story. In July, in June 1931, we get first a photo of, quote, our aviation enthusiast. Um, this is Joseph Okadowski, who was graduating in 1931 in the Hostess Diary. It's recorded he's their aviation enthusiast. Interesting. <laughs> September 1931, material for the plane which the boys are completing. Someone had gone to Marlboro Airport to pick up material for the plane that the boys are completing. We then get more names. Now this is where I'm like, something's going on here. October 1931, John Lindbergh, one of the students named John Lindbergh and Ralph Del Greco are repairing and covering the first airplane that they helped Joseph Okadowski build. When repaired, the plane is to be kept at the school as a memorial of the school's first airplane. And then in an undated file, I see it. This is the plane. They actually built an airplane. It was called the Heath. Okay, so that aviation field was meant to be somewhat in use. The aviation field would be the corner of Wayside and Road and Pride's Crossing Road. Uh, down this way. So then the case, right, became, wh where is it? <laughs> what happened to this plane? Is it in Gar Gary and Doris's basement? <laughs> what is going on? I thought that we'll never find out. We'll never know. Well, then Friday, March 3rd, just last week, I get an email from Lauren Prescott. The quote you can't see there says, I found it. <laughs> she sends me this. It's from a scrapbook. It's a new story from the local paper about how someone stole the plane. <laughs> someone had stole the plane. No wing monoplane made by schoolboys is missing. Uh, it talks about how the plane was there. It was covered with a tarp. Someone must have just taken it apart, put it on our truck and drove it away. However, it's accompanied by, that is John Lindbergh who uh, built the plane, no relation as far as I know, was a student at the school in the early 30s. Then we see other photos of the plane there. So this case captures the imagination and motivation of the students at the Wayside Inn Boys School. Building an airplane was not part of the curriculum, but it was not not part of the curriculum. It seems the learning by doing extended to the teachers and wider staff themselves who went with the flow and followed the boys energy as long, it was, as long as it was channeled into productive, efficient projects. Boys started a radio club and broadcast from the end, made amateur films, took a part in reassembled colonial homes and developed their own photos in the photographic room in the basement of the Calvin Howe house. When the school stopped in 1947, the current students dispersed, but the old boys maintained an active alumni network and met locally into the early 2000s. As we look back on an experiment begun almost 100 years ago, we can find evidence of its success in the Martha Mary Chapel and other structures built by the boys, as well as in the resurgence of, resurgence of interest today in learning by doing at all levels of education. And the particular form of vocational and cultural instruction at the Wayside Inn Boys School serves as an efficient model. While they were scheduled and supervised strictly in this small scale setting, these boys also had the freedom to explore to experiment and to build their future and ours. Thank you.